You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. The Taliban, who were called terrorists until last month, are now at the helm of a federal government. The new cabinet comprises some of the most dreaded UN-designated terrorists. In total, 17 of 33 appointments have sanctions against them. More unfortunate, however, is the news that the entire world is silently watching these developments from a distance. And in contrast to what was promised to be a moderate government, the Taliban have already issued a carbon copy of laws under which it ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001. From alteration in curricula to stifling of free speech to subjugation of women's rights, it is doing everything opposite of what it committed during the peace process and what the world feared. Twenty years after their radical Islamic rule was overthrown by US-backed forces, the Taliban are back. And this time, they are stronger and brazen. Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The name they recognize themselves with has announced its interim government nearly four weeks after they swept Kabul on 15th August last month. Mullah Muhammad Hassan Akhund, who rose to prominence for his role in the destruction of Buddhas of Bamiyan, will be the Prime Minister. Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, the Taliban's face in the peace talks, will be his deputy. Sarajuddin Haqqani, the son of the founder of another terrorist organization, Haqqani Network, will be the country's interior minister. And that's not all. 17 of the 33 cabinet members have sanctions against them. The group, which has been desperately trying to project itself as a moderate version of its previous regime and had hinted at an inclusive government during the peace talks, hasn't included even one woman in the cabinet. Alhamdulillah, the <laughs> As far as the women are concerned, Taliban is not shying away from imposing the same set of repressive and regressive laws that governed them in 1996. On being asked as to why the women were being kept away from the mainstream, the Taliban exposed itself on a national news channel. As per the misogynistic Taliban, women can't be ministers as they are simply incapable for the job. They should rather be giving birth. And those demanding rights are women of ill repute who were working for the U.S. The statement came in the aftermath of massive protests that swept capital Kabul. With women at the forefront of anti-Taliban protests, people demanded equal rights for all. In just weeks of its return, the Taliban have already asked women to remain covered in a particular manner, not to play sports, to not to be co-educated, by and large remain confined to the walls of home. People say that it is the diabolic union of Taliban and Pakistan that is destroying Afghanistan. And Pakistan must stop hatching nefarious plots against them. More, I saw a Nami 
که برای ما حکومت بسازد افغانستان یک کشور مستقل آزاد هست و همیشه می باشد اما هیچ وقت خواهان پاکستان در کشور ما نیستیم پاکستان از افغانستان بیرون شود و مداخلهای خود بند بسازد بالای افغانستان The Taliban, which largely comprises illiterate groups, is also cracking down on the education system. They are planning to alter the syllabi across schools and colleges. Students fear it will not just jeopardize their learning prospects, but will effectively cost them their career. این مشکلات و چالش‌ها در خدمت تحصیل ایجاد نکنند ما بتوانیم مثل سابق در قسمت تحصیل و در قسمت شغل اینا فعالیت کنیم and freedom of speech is a thing of past in afghanistan two journalists who dared to cover and show people's dissent to the world were detained and brutalized These horrific pictures are ominous signs of how Afghanistan is going to be like in coming times. Taliban have tried to smother protests by open firing on unarmed civilians. Meanwhile, the international community, including the United Nations, has done nothing except for lip service. They have acknowledged the crisis, condemned it, urged for peace and rights, and have moved on with their lives. It is the people of Afghanistan at the same time who are witnessing a government of the terrorists, by the terrorists, for the terrorists. Now let's talk about Pakistan, Afghanistan's eastern neighbor, which according to almost all experts around the world is responsible for the chaos and violence in Afghanistan. They believe it is the Islamabad administration and not the Taliban which is calling shots. And this carefully planned conspiracy has been aimed at projecting Pakistan as Messiah. However, the truth is polar opposite. While the Pakistan government is exploiting Afghanistan for its own diabolical agendas in the region, it is not helping Afghans even a bit in alleviating their pain. In fact, it has even deported the people who fled their homes amidst looming humanitarian crisis. Pakistan's ministers and top bureaucrats are working overtime in a bid to project themselves as the saviors in Afghan crisis. Meetings all around, proposals for regional groupings to handle Afghan situation, and the symbolic humanitarian assistance is what its playbook comprises. And the situation that is unfolding in Afghanistan is exactly what the Ghani administration and people of Afghanistan had predicted and accused Islamabad for many years. Many experts believe the inter-services intelligence was consistently making efforts to gain control over its western neighbor in order to use Taliban militants as force multiplier in line of its proxy war against a powerful eastern neighbor, India. And while Islamabad is claiming to be the leadership endeavouring the restoration of peace in Afghanistan, it is doing exactly the opposite. Its actions clearly reflect its apathy for Afghans who have been fleeing homes in search of shelter. Recently, around 270 Afghan refugees, including women and children, were deported back to their country after crossing the border into Pakistan. افغان ریفیوجیز کے بارے میں گورنمنٹ آف پاکستان کی ایک کلیئر کٹ پالیسی ہے کہ اللیگل جو بھی لوگ یہاں پہ آئے ہیں ابھی تک ان کو ہم واپس ایکسپل کر کے اپنے علاقے میں بھیجیں گے اپنے ملک میں تقریباً اب تک پچاس ایسی فیملیز ہیں دو سو ستر دو سو پچہتر لگ بگ افراد ہیں جن کو ہم نے واپس اپنے ملک بھیجا ہے اور مزید کچھ ایسی فیملیاں ہیں جس کو ہم جو اللیگل آئے ہیں کسی بھی بہانے سے ہم ان کو بغیر رجسٹریشن کیے جو آئے ہیں ان کو واپس بیچ رہے ہیں اپنے ممالک مزید بھی گورنمنٹ آف پاکستان کی یہی پالیسی رہے گی کہ ہم نے اللیگل کسی بھی امیگرنٹ کو اپنے ملک میں نہیں آنے دینا ہے اور الحمدللہ اس طرح انفلکس بھی نہیں ہے کہ بہت زیادہ لوگ تعداد میں آئے ہیں
The Afghan nationals, consisting of around 25 families, had fled the Taliban takeover and settled in tents and unfinished buildings on the outskirts of Chaman, on the Pakistani side of the border. Pakistani officials say their borders are close to all except those with valid paperwork for medical reasons, work or to see family on either side. The victims and those who are representing them say Pakistan is turning them down at a time when death and destruction is staring their future. انخلاق کی صورت میں پاکستان کا رخ کیا ہے اور پاکستان میں وہ یہاں پر پناہ گاہ ڈھونڈ رہے ہیں مگر یہاں پر جو پاکستان حکومت کی جانب سے ان کو واپس افغانستان بھیجا جا رہا ہے اس وجہ سے ان کے ساتھ یہ بھی کافی نامناسب ہے کیونکہ وہ افغانستان کے خراب حالات کی وجہ سے پاکستان کا رخ کرے ان میں سے اکثر افغان باشندے ہمارے میڈیا نے مندوں کو یہ بتا رہے ہیں کہ افغانستان میں حالات انتہائی خراب ہے اور وہاں پر سب سے بڑا مسئلہ جو ہے وہ روزگار کا ہے اور وہاں پر روزگار نہ ہونے کی وجہ سے وہ پاکستان کا رخ کرے اور وہاں پر ان کو کھانے کے لالے پڑے ہوئے ہیں According to the International Organization for Migration, drought and war have forced about 5.5 million people to flee their homes in Afghanistan, including more than 550,000 newly displaced in 2021. And Pakistan, which is taking credit for everything in Afghanistan, can simply not turn away from the crisis that is certain to expand several times in near Afghan future. The top leadership of BRICS countries held a virtual summit this week. The grouping that represents more than 26% of the world's landmass, 41% of the global population and over 20% of the global gross domestic product committed to further enhance its multidimensional engagements at both bilateral and multilateral levels. They also agreed for scientific investigation into the origins of COVID-19. The joint statement that was released in the backdrop of rising instability in Afghanistan urged the South Asian nation to resolve issues peacefully through intra-Afghan dialogue and asked its leadership to not let the Afghan soil be used as nurturing ground or safe haven by any terrorist organization. Under the Indian chair this year, the BRICS nation, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa committed to deepen their ties and broaden their work framework in order to achieve common objectives. Apart from the trade, the key focus this year was to commit to a collective endeavor towards minimizing vaccine inequity and a counter-terrorism action plan. The leaders also underlined the achievements of grouping in past years. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that setting up institutions like the New Development Bank, the Contingency Reserve Arrangement and the Energy Research Cooperation Platform were some of BRIC's key achievements so far. Last month, BRIC space agency's heads had also signed an agreement for cooperation in remote sensing satellite data sharing, which Modi said had added a new chapter of cooperation within the grouping. BRICS has made a multilateral system of maturity and sudhaar. This is a good position. We have ब्रिक्स काउंटर टेररिज्म एक्शन प्लान भी एडप्ट किया है हमारी अंतरिक्ष एजेंसियों के बीच रिमोट सेंसिंग सैटेलाइट कॉन्स्टेलेशन समझौते से सहयोग का एक नया अध्याय शुरू हो रहा है हमारे कस्टम्स विभागों के बीच सहयोग से इंट्रा ब्रिक्स व्यापार आसान होगा Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro highlighted the progress of bilateral agreements reached within its partners in the BRICS group in all areas. Bolsonaro also emphasized that Brazil and India's joint actions have produced successful results, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Diversos instrumentos assinados durante a viagem estão rendendo frutos. E nossa cooperação tem avançado, em especial nas áreas de ciência e tecnologia, energia e saúde, sobretudo no combate à pandemia de Covid-19. O comércio bilateral tem crescido em mais um sinal da retomada de nossas economias e do potencial de nossas relações. A consensus was drawn among the grouping to help the poor countries in assessing the vaccines. Although the proposal to waive patent on COVID vaccines moved by India and South Africa at the World Trade Organization couldn't muster a clear support, the member countries backed a scientific investigation into the origins of the SARS-CoV-2. The joint statement released by BRICS also expressed concern at the Afghan situation where a humanitarian crisis is being feared with the return of the Taliban. Member nations urged the Taliban to initiate an inclusive intra-Afghan dialogue to restore stability in the country and urged its leadership to not allow foreign forces or terrorists to use its soil as launching pad. Russian President Vladimir Putin also spoke about regional security after the U.S. pullout and Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Since 2006, BRICS countries have come together to deliberate on important issues under the three pillars of political and security, economic and financial, and cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges. And after major achievements under Indian chair, the grouping is optimistic of forging even closer ties under China, which is set to chair the grouping next. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. A number of Palestinians held protests in West Bank in support of six militants who broke out of a security Israeli jail past week in an escape that has alarmed Israelis. Israeli forces have mounted a surge in an effort to capture these militants who had escaped through a hole in the floor of a prison cell. The inmates, five of whom are members of the Islamic Jihad militant group and one of the Fatah group, have either been convicted or are suspected of planning or carrying out deadly attacks against Israelis. Japanese global transportation company NYK has launched electronic money platform Marco Pay for seafarers. Payment of salary by Marco Pay has begun this year. It is being used for the first time anywhere in the world. The electric money is expected to solve the problems about cash in the ship. In future, Marco Pay will expand its services by adding loan service, introduction of insurance, medical treatment service and real estate. It will be economic sphere for seafarers. まだ始まったばかりではあるんですけれども、やはりその船の上で6ヶ月から10ヶ月間、そういった長い期間仕事に従事する。で、その間各国に寄港してもですね、今このコロナバンデミックによってなかなか銀行へですとか金融サービスにアクセスできない。そういった状況の中で、この携帯電話を通じて家族への送金ができたり。戦場で受け取る給与の一部というのを電子的に受け取って他人とやり取りできるということはこれは非常にですねあの有用だということであのいい反応をいただいておりますまたこのサービスに対する期待というのもいただいておりましてまあこれをもっとどんどん使っていきたいというような声ですとかこのサービスを使っていろんなファイナンシャルサービスにアクセスしたいとそういったようなご要望をいただいております。NYK plans to expand Marco Pay operations in other Asian countries such as Myanmar in the future. The company aims to bring happiness for seafarers through Marco Pay.
the Nippon Foundation is keen to take action to dig up challenges and cover loopholes in the administrative policy. Its wide-range activities include current problem in Japan and historical discriminatory prejudice around the world. The Nippon Foundation made investigation about the awareness of 18-year-old youths on various themes. The 39th theme refers to sexual knowledge. これは、あの、the Nippon Foundation's activities are spreading around the world. The most representative initiative is to support people suffering from epidemics and disabilities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Nippon Foundation provided temporary hospital beds to fulfill the need of urgent medical requirements. The Nippon Foundation declares to be a social innovation hub and it is the chairman Yuhei Sasakawa's strong leadership that has given hope to many people around the world. Moving on. Six in India marked 417th anniversary of the installation of holy book Guru Granth Sahib in Amritsar. The event that comprised a host of religious activities including a holy procession and the display of gatka, a form of martial art taught in Sikhism, was attended by hundreds of devout Sikhs. A pool of Sikh devotees gathered at the Holy Sikh Shrine Golden Temple to celebrate the auspicious occasion of installation of the Holy Scripture of Sikhism. Guru Granth Sahib or Prakash Utsav with traditional fervor and enthusiasm in India's northern city of Amritsar. The Guru Granth Sahib is a voluminous text of 1430 parts. The text is regarded by the Sikhs as a living embodiment of their ten Sikh leaders and the text is pivotal in worship in Sikhism. Sikh congregation carried the book in a floral palanquin and offered special prayers to mark the occasion. The entire Golden Temple complex was beautifully decorated with colorful flowers. Devotees also took part in the religious colorful procession that began from the Gurdwara Ramsar Sahib to Akal Tat, the highest temporal seat of Sikhism. During the procession, devotees sang devotional songs and hymns in reverence of Guru Nanak Dev and Guru Arjun Dev. Following the procession, hundreds of conscientious devotees were seen cleaning the roads and streets. And to show fearlessness and gallant of the Sikh leaders, student devotees performed Gatka, a traditional martial art associated with Sikh religion. <laughs> The massive project to compile the Guru Granth Sahib, which has hymns from some of the ten Sikh Gurus, was undertaken by fifth Guru of the Sikhs, Guru Arjun Dev. Such celebrations focus on cultural and ethnic topics and seek to inform community members of their traditions. They involve community elders sharing stories and experiences, setting templates for maintaining unity among families. The Guru Granth Sahib is a collation of many hymns, poems and other writings from many different scholars including the Gurus and Hindu and Muslim writers. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.
सब्सक्राइब टैग टीवी यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द नोटिफिकेशन बटन